I'd be fine. You'd be arrested. Welcome to Fridays on the Fly. I'm Eric. And I'm Ward. On our podcast, we talk about our short films, scripts, and stories we've written, community art projects, and various other topics, which today includes a radio drama performance. First things first, I discussed the pennant project with someone else who's a really good artist, wins a bunch of art awards, and I told him about the project. So I was like, man, would you help us out? And he's like, I'm black. I will be arrested in 10 minutes. I was like, that's why I should help out. <laughs> I'd be fine. You'd be arrested. He the thought decoy. it was a really good idea. You wanted him as the decoy. Right, pretty much. <laughs> Sorry to miss a six foot, 220 pound, bulky black guy with a do rag. Holding a six foot red pen. <laughs> Here, hold this. We'll be right back. So, I have a question. I'm driving to work last week. And I always slow down a little bit, people in the median, because they like to jump in front of cars. So, they're in the median. I'm like, okay, they don't look like they're moving. I'm cruising along at 45 miles per hour. They saunter, it's not like they walk, it's not like they jog, they saunter into the road and saunter in front of me. I have to slam on the brakes to stop from hitting them. They don't look at me, they don't wave. Now here's my confusion, and maybe people are ignorant, but my thought is, if you step in front of a car, A, you make sure they're going less than 15 miles an hour. B, if you do, you wave at them. And the wave's not saying, hey, thanks for stopping, but it's a wave for saying, hey, thanks for not running over me in your 4,000 pound car. 150, 200 pound human being, 4,000 pound. No, the person's gonna lose. The person is gonna lose. <laughs> You know, a parking lot where cars are going slow anyway, I'll walk right in front of somebody because they're going slow. Right. And I waved. Oh, so this person could have been drunk or on drugs. It was in the morning. They, they, they looked like they were dressed for work. It's still very possible. <laughs> it's, where were they? Were? I'm guessing Bojangles. <laughs> That's where they were sauntering. I notice this a lot. The people walk in front of you and don't even wave, don't even look at you. It's the same thing. When you stop for somebody at a crosswalk, they walk slowly. Man, I don't move quickly really anywhere, but I at least give that little fake like I'm running across, you know, where I'm not actually running, but I give it the little hop step and like I'm moving across, throw them a little wave, but I'm not actually moving any quicker, probably than most anyone else. I'm trying to make it look like I'm putting a little effort into it. And the fake run is great. I often do the <laughs> fake run. You're not moving any faster, but it sure looks like you're trying hard. Exactly right. Yeah, this person didn't even do that. I mean, are we as a society failing and not teaching people that, hey, do the fake shamble across the road? Do a little wave. Thank people for not killing you. This is a topic that can get way offhand real quick if we're talking about people and manners and the way things are. I, mean, I think if you want to see how well-mannered our civilization is, look at how they use the crosswalk. How they cross the street. <laughs> I bet Europe, I bet those people are hustling like nobody's business, waving all over the place. No, definitely not. You no. don't think so? No, I've been there. No. Were you near Bojangles? Was that the problem? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. So I went to Honduras, I think it was, last year. It was a Bojangles. In Honduras, a Bojangles. There's nothing else. It is like the most run-down neighborhood you could ever imagine. And in the middle of it, there's a Bojangles. And then bars. And then a brothel. <laughs> I was amazed. I was like, that's a Bojangles over there. Are you a Bojangles fan? No. Why not? Uh, I'm not a really big fast food fan, period. Well, I like Bojangles. And I was wondering, one night last week... Why do no fast food places deliver? Pizza Hut, all these pizza places deliver? I don't know if you saw the news, but Taco Bell said that they are going to deliver. The problem is, when you order lunch at Taco Bell as one person, it's like $4. You'd have to have 12 people order something for it to be worthwhile for them to come and deliver to you. I don't know how that's going to work out for Taco Bell. You know, last week, I would have paid $5 on the top for Bojangles to deliver me some food. <laughs> yeah, but it really isn't worth somebody to come out to your house and deliver you something to be paid $5. Pizza places, are their profit margins so high they can just send out drivers to deliver this food? Well, you know, mostly they get paid by delivery. You'll get a dollar a delivery, whatever tips you make. I mean, it definitely is an economy of scale thing. You deliver one person, one item. No right. good. But if you right. can get a route and deliver a bunch of people food, right. obviously it works out better. I don't understand why no fast food places do this. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Arby's, yeah, they'd never work out. People would not order enough Arby's food. Why? Arby's, Arby's is, is expensive. Arby's is terrible. I, I like Arby's. You don't like Bojangles, but you like Arby's. Bojangles, when you touch things, you immediately get greasy. Whether it's a biscuit or those, oh, those little potato rounds, they're delicious. And it's not like a little grease. You need to wash your hands. You can't do enough of this wiping on your shirt to get the grease off. The second you touch the front of your phone, you're going to see the grease on the phone. That's the magic of Bojangles. <laughs> so you're still young. 
Wait till you hit about mid thirties. The magic of Bojangles is all around the middle of your of your body. <laughs> Look, honey, the magic of Bojangles. You want some of this? A magical rainbow that goes around your midsection. <laughs> I can hear you getting fatter. It's starting to hit me. No. Yes, it's starting. What do you weigh? Like 150 pounds? Well, I weighed myself just for the heck of it. Somebody had a digital scale. I was in the person's house. And I yeah. think, hey, might as well use that digital scale. The I mean, they're not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> wow, 160. That's the most I've ever weighed. 160. How old are you? 32. You're 32? I'm 32. Okay, maybe it won't hit you. Well, maybe it'll hit you later, a little bit later. It's, it's about 32, 33 for me that I guess I started putting on some weight. It's starting. Yeah, it, how much do you think I weigh? I would guess 170. 198, roughly? Wow. And we're the same height. You carry it well. <laughs> you know, I've been this height since high school, and I was 120 in high school. I was the same thing. I was just like you. I mean, when we first met, I was thin like you. I mean, I probably weighed like 165, 170. You don't consider yourself thin now? Thin? No. Average? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I would you're, think you're average to thin. What do you consider yourself, thin? Well, average to thin now. We can't be both average to thin. I weigh 38 more pounds than you. We're the same height, and we're only six years difference. But you carry it well. <laughs> I don't know what that means, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible at guessing weights. Like, they at work, people are like, oh, yeah, we're guessing weights. Of course, nobody could guess I weighed at that time 150. They're like, oh, really? I would have thought you weighed 180. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you weighed like 250. I would have thought you weighed 240. <laughs> You haven't hit it yet. There's a point in your life it's going to hit you. Your metabolism is going to slow down. It's starting. You're going to start to notice there's some extra stuff happening here around the belly. Oh, yeah. And and up in the face and in the neck. Yeah, it'll it'll hit you. I have no doubt. (laughs) I just try to work out. I'll try to work out every now and then, but it just never lasts because I always have so much I'm doing. I feel like the other problem with fast food delivery is that they can barely get it to you when you come through the window. They always make me pull up. I don't want to pull up. I'm at the window. This is fast food. What is going on here, people? Why am I pulling up to a spot? That drives me insane. Insane. What drives me more insane is sometimes there's nobody behind me, but I still have to pull up and have the little woman come out and hand me the bag of food. Is this for real? I feel like it used to be quicker. I don't know. I don't have fast food a lot, but some days I'll get it and it'll come right to the window and boom. And then some days I'll order the smallest thing. We're going to have to bring that soda out to your car. What's going on back there? They need a ticker window of what they already have made and ready. Just like, yeah, I want the thing that's already ready. So <laughs> what do you got back there that you had from yesterday? How was it chilly today? <laughs> Talked about it last week. Boyhood. So I watched it. It's this movie by Richard Lankletter, the guy who made Days to Confuse. Probably his most popular thing. What else did he make? He also did A Scanner Darkly, which is a rotoscope movie with Keanu Reeves, Robert Downey Jr., Woody Harrelson. Really? And Winona Ryder. He's done a lot of things. To me, has this kind of John Hughes quality about him, about his movies. John Hughes seemed to be in touch with youth of a certain time. And I feel like Richard Linklater has that same kind of feeling. Days of Confused, Before Sunshine. Oh, yes, he did Before Before Midnight. Oh, man. Slacker. I would argue that Before Sunrise and Before Sunset are his best movies. Oh, yeah, you told me about this a long time ago. Those movies are amazing. He did Waking Life. It's really neat because in essence it analyzes what's a dream, what's not a dream. In one scene, it's a callback to Before Sunrise, where you have Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy. And I love the quote because he's talking about what if life is a dream? Because when you dream, the dream is often longer than reality. You know, like Inception talked about how a dream is 16 times longer than reality, which I'm sure they made that figure up. Who knows? He says, well, you know, what if our life is somebody's death dream, their last dream before they die? It's a cool thought. Before Sunrise and Before Sunset, I love those movies. Yeah, I have not awesome. seen those, no. I should probably watch those. Those both Ethan Hawke? I mean, and Julie it... Delpy, yeah. Oh, okay. Right. And he made a third one a couple years ago, Before Midnight. And I thought it was okay, but it wasn't really that good. Are these movies all supposed to supposed to play together? Yeah, it's the same pair of characters. Right. So in the first one, they meet. In the second one, they were going to meet again, but they lost each other's contact information because they live in different countries. How much time that has lapsed in real life is what's done in the movies. Uh, the first one is really cool. It's two characters. The entire movie is them talking. That's all they do. There's no real plot. Like a traditional movie, people argue which one's better. It's hard to say because before Sunset builds upon the first movie. Right. So without the first movie, it probably is not as good. So what did you think about Boyhood? I thought it was awesome. You know, movies, I watch them, and I think, I would have done this differently, I would have done that differently. This movie, at the end of it, I almost wanted to clap. I can't think of a single thing I'd want to change with it. I asked someone if they'd seen the movie, and they said, yes, it was awful. 
and they were older in their 60s. I thought maybe it was because maybe they were too far removed from their youth to understand the movie. I don't know. What would cause someone to see it and go, that was awful. That actor, the old boy, looks nothing like the actor, the young boy. <laughs> Those actors are terrible. It took them 12 years to film the movie. Before I watched it, I kind of had something in my mind. He starts out at age six. And they were going to, you know, play a scenario. And then something was going to come up on the screen and say, Mason, age seven. It was going to keep going like that. Well, that never happened. You're wondering if you're in a new year sometimes. How old is he now? I love that about the movie. Don't know every little thing. And so many movies that have a time lapse. Either you get actors that they don't look alike. Right. Or you have an actor play the same role 12 years apart. And this one... No movie's ever captured that time lapse like this because this one, they're not faking it. It got it. Is that what makes that movie good? No. Okay, what makes the movie good? Captures childhood. These fragments of scenes, these fragments of memories that make up this kid's life. At the end, you can look at him. I kind of have an idea of why he is the way he is, why he's making the choices he is. Right. It all builds upon itself. The fact that it took 12 years to make is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. He couldn't even sign his actor's contracts because you can't have a contract that long. Yeah, but you think once you'd film the first time around, they'd want to see it through. And it seems like everybody sure. saw it through. I've read some interviews with him. He told Ethan Hawke, he's like, hey, if I die, you got to finish this for me. Yeah, I didn't realize Before Sunset and Before Sunrise were both Ethan Hawke. He's filming Boyhood and filming these other movies with Ethan Hawke. I didn't think he could have ended any better way. I read this after I watched the movie. The girl he meets in the last scene is the same girl that's in one of the earlier classroom scenes when he's seven or eight. No. The one that passes him a note? No. Same actress. Now I'm going to have to watch it again. And I don't know anything about Richard Linkletter or his life, but I think that this is probably him. He had to pull from it. You know, Davidson Confused. I know yes. he said that he pulled from his life in that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, in Davidson Confused, the main character who's played by... Willie Wiggins. Played by him. His mom is single, and he has an older sister. And his name is Mitchell. And this kid's name is Mason. So I thought maybe it was just both of these characters were kind of mirroring his life. And is the time lapse what makes this movie great? Yeah. Look at Days and Confused. There's no time lapse, but he captures this moment. He captures life. I think he did the same thing here. Do you because... think it's better than John Hughes? I mean, have you ever seen any John Hughes movies? Pretty in Pink. You know, I've seen a lot of John Hughes movies at a time that I know they were John Hughes. No. Yeah. So now everything is kind of retrospect. Breakfast Club. I mean, yeah, I've seen all those, but to me, they just seem kind of 80s. He was capturing the youth of that time. Sure. A lot of people applauded him because he was our age making these movies about teenagers. Like, he still had perspective. When I was watching the movie, I could feel like the kid felt. I don't feel like I'm so far removed from childhood that I can't remember those feelings. But I also really empathized with his mother. I don't know if you're there yet. It's your age, and you only have one kid, and... But man, when his mother was like, she was going to be alone, I just thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> my kids are going to leave one day. <laughs> John Hughes was pretty prodigious during the 80s, wasn't he? Didn't he make a ton of stuff? A ton of stuff. The original Home Alone, probably Home Alone 2, I really thought it was a really great movie. Now, and now I want to watch it again just to see if I can recognize the girl who he meets. I'll bet there's a ton of other things in that movie, too, that you just don't know about unless you read it somewhere or he tells you. At one point... The father uh, that she's married to, the, the alcoholic, the first alcoholic. Yeah, which one? <laughs> the, first, the first alcoholic. He sends the kids into the store for him to cash a check. The guy who's working in the liquor store is the guy from Dazed and Confused who works in the liquor store. <laughs> it was, I was dying. I don't know if you remember the scene from Dazed and Confused, but he's behind the counter and Willie Wiggins' character is, is trying to buy a six pack of beer. And in front of him is a pregnant woman smoking, <laughs> buying liquor, and the guy behind the counter is going, now don't forget, Eat a green thing every day. <laughs> She's buying her liquor and literally has a cigarette. She's just looking at him like, whatever. That really tickled me. I, th I thought he must be related to Link Ladder or something. I'm going to look that up. And yeah, I know awards don't matter, but I was surprised <coughs> Boyhood did not get anything. I figured Link Ladder would probably get a Best Director award. It was up for an Oscar, right? Best Picture and Best Director lost both categories to Birdman by Inaritu. He lost both to Birdman? Birdman got director oh, no, and I see Birdman, but I haven't seen that yet. The reason maybe didn't win, because the plot wasn't as heavy as it could have been. Certainly, watching him grow up was amazing, and watching his life choices was amazing, but there was nothing really super dramatic. But I think that's probably why it maybe didn't win an Oscar over Birdman. Yeah, a lot of people posited that Birdman won because it's about actors. 
when you make a based on true story movie, that always does well at the Oscars. I love Boyhood, and I have seen Birdman. I was disappointed in Birdman. I was expecting to like it a lot more than I did. Yeah, that's, that doesn't bode well for probably my opinion. I love Michael Keaton. I mean, I really like Michael Keaton. He's the man. He's my yeah. man crush. <laughs> Michael Keaton? Yeah. And I'm going to go with John Cusack for mine. Bill Nighy? Or yes. British guy. Yeah. Uh, he's awesome. Yeah. He's just starting to like hit my radar, and I'm like, this guy's what really good. What have you seen good. him in? Pirate Radio. If you haven't seen Pirate Radio, go out and get it right now. I mean, go find it. Go get a channel. Go check the red box. Order it from Netflix. I don't care what you do. Go watch that movie. Yeah, you um, recommended that after you saw it. Very good recommendation. Yeah, the Excellent. music alone was phenomenal. It's something you could watch more than once and go, oh, I missed that the first time. The most exotic Marigold Hotel or something like that. I don't yeah, know if the title is exactly pretty right. Close. I saw him in that and I thought, gosh, he's really good in that too. You I've know? seen him in Shaun of the Dead. Oh, Shaun, oh, of course, Shaun of the Dead. Oh, Shaun of the Dead. He was actually in um, Hot Fuzz too. Yeah, he was. You're right. I forgot he was in Fuzz, yeah. Oh, what I really liked him in was Love Actually. I haven't seen that. He nails everything he's in. It's hard for me to watch a movie with the title Love Actually. Because I feel like it's going to be this awful love story and they're going to play tennis or something and I'm not going to like it. It's much better than you would think. Okay, I'll have to check it out. It had a bunch of stars. It had... And, then that's what, and that's kind of what pushes me away from yeah. it. Once I see the bunch of stars, I'm like... Eh, it might not be that great. Yeah, but this one had Alan Rickman, and yeah. you know, usually he's in pretty, pretty good, stuff. pretty decent. Well, he's stuff. in Die Hard, you know. He, if, if you're a Die Hard, I yeah. mean, you know, he's earned a pass for everything else. <laughs> pretty much anything with Hugh Grant's not going to be good. Which is one of the problems I think Love actually had is it starred Hugh Grant. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why I passed on it right away. I think that's oh, why most Grant? people passed on it. Thanks. No thanks. So he's not really the main character, right. but a group of people. I have enjoyed, I think I like one movie that Hugh Grant's ever been in, and it was about a boy. Only because the kid who played the boy happened to be a really good actor, and now he's like a superstar, and nobody recognizes him from being about a boy. Let's go back to Bill Nighy. And I don't know, how do you say his last name? Nigby? Nighy? Nighy? I, I think it's Nighy. It. I know I've looked it up before, because I wonder, but I can't ever remember. In Pirate Radio, he points. But he kind of points with his middle finger. So I looked that up because it looked strange to me. Come to find out he has some type of condition with his hands that causes his hands to curl up. So he points with his middle finger because that's the finger that he could straighten out. So I saw Pirate Radio on TV and they're blurring it out. But he's not actually, he's not actually giving anyone the finger. He's just pointing. <laughs> Before we stop talking about movies, let me tell you about what I watched. What did you watch? PTU, Police Tactical Unit. Involve Samuel L. Jackson and Colin Farrell. Sounds a lot like one of their movies. No, this one's actually good. <laughs> so last week I watched Election with Johnny Toe. This week was PTU with Johnny Toe. Nothing like PCU. What's PCU? PCU is a movie with David Spade and Jeremy Piven. I'm sure it's much better than that. <laughs> Half the characters' names are based on their physical descriptions. Fat guy. <laughs> Long hair guy. <laughs> but does it actually meet their physical descriptions? Oh, yeah. You know how you call a fat guy slim? These are dead on. Head on, yeah. <laughs> really cool movie. A few things I like about this is that most American movies want to just hit you in the face with all these details and explain everything. This one gives you just enough so you know what's going on, but it doesn't really go too deep to where it's an overload. This main cop, you think it's kind of shady, you're not quite sure... He loses his gun. You can tell none of the other cops like him. Most American movies have a scene where, I really don't like that guy. He's a terrible cop. This doesn't really give you that. It lets you get your own opinion of it. This tactical unit, which is helping this guy find his gun. The movie is the special team trying to help this guy find his gun. Okay. That's the movie. It doesn't sound like much, but it was well done. Turns out it was in his bedroom in the nightstand the whole time. <laughs> well, no, in the beginning it shows him getting beaten up and his gun getting stolen. Oh. What, is getting his gun back that big of a deal? I mean, I don't... Well, you know, he'd have to report it to his superiors. And oh, gotcha. I don't know what they do in Hong Kong. I assume it'd be bad. He gets lashed. Could be. <laughs> Very well could be. So while this movie was made in the early 2000s, it feels like a lot like an 80s movie. Because the kids look like these punk kids, long hair, wild clothes. Is Jean-Claude Van Damme in it? He's not. <laughs> Doing split kicks? <laughs> he should be. <laughs> and they hang out at the arcade, which seems completely foreign in a 2000s movie. An arcade? <laughs> what is that? Well, they still have arcades nowadays. Do they? Except they're giant, like Dave and Buster's or Chuck E. Cheese. Maybe they exist in Hong Kong, they don't exist over here. If you like Hong Kong movies and you don't mind reading subtitles, check it out. I definitely will. You got this off Netflix? Netflix DVD. Oh, Netflix DVD. Because it's on streaming, I wouldn't have gotten oh, DVD. Right. I know it's worth I know I'd probably use them, but there'd probably be months at a time that I would never get a DVD. And there's so much on Netflix 
we just decided to watch Skyfall the other night. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. all right, kids, we're watching James Bond. Which, strangely enough, they're not that bad. There might have been like three swear words. They never show any heavy sex scenes in any Bond movies. You never see too much. I mean, other than people being killed, you see a lot of that. There's a lot of people that happens in James Bond movies. Believe it or not, yeah, it does. <laughs> License to kill. I have to get the Netflix DVDs because at one time I was on a quest to watch all 250 movies on the IMDb Top 250. When did that list come out? I have no idea. The problem with the list, it updates every week. Oh, see, I so can't you're chasing keep track of that. I mean, at one time, I had 249 of 250. No. And the only movie I didn't have was this foreign movie that hadn't been released in the United States. By the time I get that movie, I think it's right around all these superhero movies that have been released. Right. So I had all these movies I couldn't watch, so I gave up. 249, man, you're so close. I know. I'm I wonder how many of them I've seen. When you first saw the list, did you recognize most of the American movies? Yes. And when you're trying to chase the list, you notice a few trends, like Indian, Bollywood-type films. Right. There must be some kind of secret cartel that ranks them high to get them on the list. <laughs> Every single one of them I've seen, they all have the same star. This this one yeah. guy. It doesn't matter if he's playing a 12-year-old or a 50-year-old. Right. He's the guy. All the movies are three hours long. They all include very long musical sequences. Yep. No, that's annoying. So now that I'm not chasing the list, I probably will never watch another Indian movie because they are, in my opinion, torturous. I don't know if Slumdog Millionaire, is that an Indian movie or an American movie? That's American. Danny Boyle, the director of oh, okay. 28 Days Later, and Sunshine. And gotcha. 127 hours or 128 hours? Oh, uh, the Aaron Paul story. Uh, not the Aaron Paul story, but <laughs> yeah, <kind of. laughs> the Aaron Paul story. <laughs> My arm's off. Yo, what is his name? Ah, it's going to drive me crazy. That's um, the guy. Yeah, that guy. Drank his own pee. He was thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> it's like AFI. Is that, does that sound right? AFI is a yeah. list. They'll have it on TV, and they'll be like, AFI's 100 Greatest Movies. And it seems so cliche. Gone with the Wind. The Ten Commandments. Really? Are these really still considered top 100 movies? I enjoy watching The Ten Commandments, but top 100 movies, I don't know if we're there. can't discount a movie just because a long time ago, now they've done it so much. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, there's some movies like To Kill a Mockingbird. I love that movie. It's always going to be a great movie to me. Really, was Gone with the Wind really that great of a movie? It was huge in its day. In its day. Because there was really nothing else out. But you try to watch that movie now, and it's like, oh my gosh. When are they going to burn these plantations to the ground? I'm done here. Let's kill these Southerners and move on. Let's take Slumdog Millionaire. That was a big deal because it won Best Cinematography, and is the first movie to win it shot on a handheld camera. And so you think, oh, that was a big deal. Well, nowadays it's less of a big deal. You can't discount it. Just oh, no, I still think Slumdog's a, a big deal. I still think it's a great movie. I'm not saying not discount it, but I feel like they're putting these movies in there just because Ben-Hur. Really? Ben-Hur? Are we really sitting around watching Ben-Hur? Nobody's sitting around watching Ben-Hur. I think you can definitely argue, is this movie still relevant? It's not so much the relevance that gets me. I know back in the day that these were great movies. They didn't really have the amount of movies that we have nowadays. I think when you look at the stories, I don't think they're that great. They were great then, and they were great up till the 80s. We didn't have this revolution of everyone making movies. They just don't hold up, not all of them. But I can still look back at older movies. I do love The Ten Commandments. I think it's hard for an older movie. I mean, so many older movies almost appear slapstick. Because violence was toned down. Right. And so I'm a generation that violence is realistic, bloody, it's gory. I go back and the guy flies halfway across the room and he's shot by a little gun. <laughs> right. I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. Right. But at the time, that was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, movies fade like that. It's hard for me to like older movies. One older movie that I always come back to is The Wages of Fear. I've never heard of that. Awesome movie. That, I believe, is on the top 250. But it's these guys driving truckfuls of dynamite from one location to another. And very few people volunteer for these jobs because if you hit a bump too hard, your truck will blow up and you'll die. I don't like many older movies. I always think that when I think older movies. Nothing feels hokey about it. So what's the oldest movie that you still love like man that's phenomenal is there any movies like through the 60s or 70s like i don't know what else on the list was like french connection on the list i mean probably you know that's something that's a good movie. i could probably still watch when i think of movies that i really love now like oh i could watch it i think the earliest movies i can watch over and over again would be mid 80s like back to the future if it's on i can have it on all the time godfather but that's kind of cliche even watch that. yeah i can't even watch that anymore I've seen a lot of recent movies, so when I go back and see some of the older movies that set the precedent, Right. it just feels cliche to me, even though the problem is, that movie set it, it's just lost on me, because I've seen some of the movies that have copied it. 
Because that's right. the problem. A movie does something new and impressive, everybody copies it. And then it becomes cliche. I did watch The Matrix again the other night. It was on HBO, and I thought, that movie's still really good. I really like that it's movie. It's still really good. When he fights Morpheus, when he's learning how to use his skill, and they're fighting in the dojo, I think is what it is, mm-hmm. that's my favorite part of the movie. I love when he bends over and he's like, do you think that's air you're breathing? <laughs> I love that part. Lawrence Fishburne, Lawrence Samuel L. Jackson Fishburne was phenomenal in that movie. I saw something. Was, do you ever get these two guys confused? And it was Lawrence Fishburne and Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> All the time. That's one of those few movies I remember growing up that I saw that and I knew this movie is something else. I can remember sitting down in front of the TV, Saturday night, that movie coming on. Yeah. And that first sequence where you have Trinity running through and she's making yeah. these crazy jumps. It's like, hold on, what is going on here? Something's weird. Right. You don't even know what to think. And yeah, I still remember watching the first time I watched that movie. But see, I feel like that movie's been redone a hundred times in the past ten years. But nothing's better than The Matrix. That yeah. bullet time thing? Because that was crazy when they had that and all these cameras right. and they did that. And right. a ton of people copied that. You really can't do bullet time anymore because it just no, doesn't feel cliche. because it's Matrix. Yeah. You're, you're doing The Matrix. It really brought Keanu Reeves to life because before that, I'm sorry, none of those movies. He, he was Bill or Ted. I don't, I don't remember which one he was, but that's who he was always to me. Bill S. Preston Esquire. Wasn't he Ted? I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was Ted. But then he was in Parenthood, and that solidified it even more. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that's the gap. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then he did Speed, and it was Speed like... Speed was awesome. Oh, Speed was awful. Oh, my... I love Speed. Gosh, Speed was awful. So hokey. It's a little hokey, and his acting <sighs> leaves a bit to be desired. Oh, gosh, his acting leaves a ton to be But what a fun desired. movie. There's this part where Keanu Reeves has got his gun on on Patrick Swayze, but he can't shoot him because he loves him so much. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever fire your gun in the air and yell, oh, we could have a whole conversation about Hot Fuzz. Actually, we could have a whole conversation about all the movies that they've made together. The Alien one, I think, might probably might be the only one you haven't seen. Where they go to Area 51. The camper, the RV. And the, right. I have right. seen that. You have seen that. And Detective Zoil. <laughs> His first name is Lorenzo. Lorenzo Zoil. <laughs> that makes me chuckle every time I see it. Did you see the final trilogy, Sean Dead, Hot Fuzz, and the last one, The World's End? Did you see the yes. World's End? What did you think about that? I thought it was okay. We should talk about this another time. But just okay, right? Well, what's your... It's hard, oh. to, it's hard to compare. I love Shaun of the Dead. But when Hot Fuzz came out, that was amazing. I've probably watched that movie 15 times. I don't know about you, you and Jennifer. I know Jen- Jennifer has even seen it and liked it. I mean, Jennifer has quoted it. Shaun of the Dead's good, too. The world's in, it's good. There's just It's missing, missing that thing. It's missing that thing, that hot fuzz. And I, don't wonder, the I wonder if they just had too many actors. Got too big. I wonder if they Maybe. brought it down, just had Simon Pegg. And that Nick Frost. Nick Frost. Yeah. Because yeah. they have great chemistry. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And that's really the only thing they changed from the two movies. It's they added more people. I didn't think it was bad. I just, and I really like the guy who plays also in Sherlock. Martin Freeman. Like Martin Freeman. Man, that guy is He's good. Awesome. Gosh, that guy's good. These, all these British actors seem to be like coming out of the woodwork. I like him as Watson. I thought he was actually really good in that movie. What was the name of the movie again? The last movie? The World's End. The World's End, yeah. Martin Freeman also was in The Office UK. Right. And in Hot Fuzz. Was he in Shaun of the Dead? He only had a small part in Hot Fuzz. He was one of the main guys, even though he wasn't a main guy for long. Do you really want me to call the Chief Inspector? Turns out you're making us look bad. Can't be the Sheriff of London. <laughs> Too many good quotes for that movie. There's another art project that I wanted to talk about. The shadow of William that I showed you, the picture. Sure. What I wanted to say across the wall, I finally came up with something that I would rather say. We originally come up with something like, this is my new art class. Mm -hmm. I think that's just too on the nose. I'm not looking to point the finger at Rockingham County. Last year when I was in New York, I was walking through the subway with the kids, and I saw something painted on a wall, and it said... Don't tell me. I want to guess. Eat more chicken. (laughs) That's definitely not it. (laughs) Five dollar foot long. (laughs) I'm eating it. <laughs> I, I cannot stand that about McDonald's tagline. I'm loving it. I'm eating it. Isn't that enough? I'm loving it. I'm in the subway and I see this and I glance at it and I keep walking and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was really good. It wasn't art- artistic. It was just drawn on a wall in like red marker and it said, the earth without art is just eh. Take art out of mm-hmm. earth and it leaves you with eh. I picked up on that. I, I wasn't sure. It's late. <laughs> but I thought, 
That's exactly what I want that to say. And I hate copying someone else's work, but there's no better way to put that. Yeah. And you know they stole it from somebody. I looked it up, and I, I thought maybe I can find some origin of it, and I couldn't find it. So really? I really like it. You know what? I'd like to make six of them, because there's about six different places around town I'd like to stick them. And this is, just so I'm clear, the, we're printing out on paper, cutting out, kind of cut and paste. Yeah, okay. and, glue, and to the tape it to the wall. But Again, I, I don't want to do anything that's going to destroy someone's property. That's certainly not my intention. But I do want people to see it, and I do want them to be shocked by it. Like, oh my gosh, there's graffiti on the wall. But also to read it and go, oh my gosh, there's something more there. I think that sentiment much better than this is my new art class or art project. Yeah, I just I thought about it all week and I just couldn't come up with anything better. I think it's cool that it's not graffiti on the wall, that it's paper, it's removable. Right. It's not our intention to destroy us. I don't want to go to jail. I mean, I have no problem even going back a couple of days later and taking it down. That doesn't bother me. I mean, I don't want someone else to go out of their way and, and take that down. But yeah, would I like to go around town and stick like six of those up? Definitely. If it doesn't work out that we can't cut out each letter and tape it up and we just have to tape up a banner, fine. Yeah, I'm sure it'll go a lot quicker that way. Even though I want it to look like graffiti and I want to cut out the letters and put tape all along the letters. And I really thought about the quickest way we could make that happen. It could be quick, but not as quick as just taping up a whole banner. My thought would be that if we can figure out where we want it ahead of time, maybe we can take a picture of the wall and try to blend in the background oh, of the paper. The paper. Okay. It's not going to be a perfect match, but from right. 10 feet away... Probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I don't want you to get in trouble at work either, too. I mean, they're printing the stuff out. I mean, they know I did. I pay for it. Okay, cool. It's awesome. actually funny. I've printed stuff at work before, and one day I thought, you know, I'm in essence, I'm stealing office supplies. Right. So I went to the receptionist. I'm like, hey, I've been printing this stuff. I want to pay for it. She's like, you don't have to. Everybody does it. Like, I get everybody does it. Yeah. I just want to pay for it. She's right. Like, you really don't have to. I'll think about how much I want to pay. You think about how much you want to charge me. I want to pay this much. She's like, okay, that's fine. I was like, perfect. Excellent. So then where does the money go? It goes into her pocket for coffee? Yeah, it goes. there's a coffee fund. Okay. But right. She's like, if you really want to do it, it makes you feel better. I'm probably buying coffee for the entire office. So you'd be able to do that, take a picture of the wall, and be able to print that behind there? It's inexact, but you can get close. Like right. maybe, do you have any idea of where you want to do it? Let's say, let's just say you're doing it on concrete. Yeah, there's a couple. There's a couple like cinder, painted cinder block walls. There's, you know, there's a brick wall. There's, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different places as I drove through town. I was like, oh, it look good there. Oh, it look good there. Oh, they would look good right there. I mean, I might take a picture of a cinder block wall and try to size the cinder block behind it. Or maybe if the predominant color is gray or brown. I right. just pick a gray or brown, try to fade it where it gets close. Yeah. But I think trying to cut out each letter and taping it on there is a ton of work. And I really think if we can get a color close. Well, what I thought about was getting double-sided tape and kind of covering the whole back of it. Mm -hmm. And then just cutting it out as we go and cut it out, cut it out, you know. But I know that takes a long time. It's only the cutting out was as fast as it it was. Right, as I just said, yeah. I really think if we want to get detailed, I can take a picture of the wall head on, try to size that image, and it'd be close. We need a graffiti font. Plenty of them out there. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. I really like that. You can get the image of William on Facebook if you want. I'm sure you know some way to do it, but I just don't know how you would. I guess you can just print it out with the wall behind it and we could just cut out William. That I would at least like to do. I don't want the image that's behind that shadow to show up. And I'd like to make it darker, his shadow. Whatever you want to do graphically, chances are I you can, can do it. Happen. Yeah. I got that from the Christmas thing we did at church. People still come up to me and they're like, Disney, that was good. <laughs> I'm like, huh, that was two years ago. <laughs> Gotta be flattered they still remember that two years later. Yeah. There's a woman still at church who still comes up to me and says, the Christmas story one, she loved it. She said she got every gag and thought it was hilarious. And I'm like, thanks. She said that's you know, one of her favorite movies. I'm like, funny. The cast that was in the, our play, half of them had never seen it. So, <laughs> Okay, I do this really good voice, but it's where I talk, and you can hear me with my mouth closed. Whoa, let me in. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta work that in somehow. Freaks the kids out. Like I swallowed a little person there inside of me. His name's Roger. <laughs> he just wants to get out. They're like, wake up, Roger. Wake him up. I think it's time for our radio drama performance.
In his latest case, Abe Zanikin finds himself face to face with a frustrating suspect accused of extreme violence. I want an answer. Did you do it? Did you see who did it? What do you know? <laughs> he thwarts my question yet again as he points out the window. We've been playing this cat and mouse game for too long. I grip my teeth, realizing I won't be able to get any information out of this suspect. I ask another throwaway question. Were you even present when the transgression occurred? No response. It's amazing how stupidity can almost be mistaken for genius. If this kid wasn't four years old, I'd be beating the crap out of him right now. Instead, it's time to change his diaper. Mr. Zanarkin, I think that's quite enough. I understand you're his teacher and have a job to do. But he's got answers. I intend to extract them. This is not the matter to go about it. I think a school teacher could form a better sentence. Then again, what does I know? My knee hits the tiny table as I struggle to rise from the pint-sized chair. I was a giant in a tiny torture chamber. <sighs> That's enough, kid. You can run home now. I follow him to the door. Maybe I can corner the next snot-nosed kid without Miss Prim breathing down my neck. Mr. Zanarkin, I'll bring the next child when I return. I'll save you the trouble and retrieve it myself. No! No! No, you won't. You wait right here, okay? The gall this woman has to order me around like I was just another brat. The mighty have indeed fallen, but that's no excuse to stop listening to this adventure. I'm going to get to the bottom of this pint-sized problem because Abe always gets his man. Or... Todd. Abe Zanarkin rides again. It happened like this. Miss Prim, who you just met, her principal called me on my expertise. It seems while Miss Prim turned her back, one kid bit another amidst the skirmish that ensued when her eyes were averted. These kids were keeping mum. They just wouldn't turn on each other. Maybe they were hungry. I know I was hungry. I was still thinking about those Cheetos. It was up to me to take it up the level. I was going to turn on the heat. Sir, these, these are only children, you know. Yeah, you might believe that a child is innocent and precious, but inside each and every one of these kids is a skilled manipulator with years of experience. That's how they get through life. It seems they've already gotten to you. Maybe I took it too far. I wasn't sure. You've gone too far! The more you know, the old bat was about to flip. Maybe she was the biter. What a twist that would be. Everybody was hungry today. <clears throat> There's a child present, Mr. Zanarkin. She said my name with a sneer. Maybe she was protecting the culprit. Caden, you just sit right here, honey, okay? Everything is going to be okay. Yeah, it'll be okay if you cooperate. It's time to get to the bottom of this bag. <clears throat> Man, these chairs are tiny. Smaller than Peter Jackson's cameo in Hot Fuzz. Where were you when it happened? I, I want some crayons. Did you see anyone bite or get bitten? <laughs> I like dinosaurs. Surely you heard Rachel scream after she was bitten. I like the little dinosaur nuggets. And, and then I, I bite the heads off the nuggets. But, um, and then I just throw the rest of the nugget away because uh, after you, the poop comes out of the back of the nugget, uh, the, uh, the poop dinosaur, and you don't want to get the poop on the... Mommy says you shouldn't eat poop. And she says that you should wash your hands after you're done. And I, I just like the nuggets. I, I dip them in ketchup, so it's like blood. And so I don't eat the, I, the poop. Mommy says don't touch the poop. Antlers attached to my skull would be more helpful and likely less painful. At this point, headless dinosaur nuggets were starting to sound pretty good. You can take this one away, Miss, uh, Pr Luckily, I caught myself before I said Prim. It's Miss Landon. That's the same as when I introduced myself 20 minutes ago. You think a detective could remember that? I'm thinking write it in a notebook or something. She was feisty. I like that in a woman. I didn't see a ring on her finger, but that could go one of two ways. I'll be right back with the next child. I hate waiting. And I wasn't sure I could get any info out of these kids. The years of toiling away in the school system had made them hard. I'd have to make my own way. Psst, 
Hey, hey, kid, come here. Just maybe I've got candy. I didn't. I just wanted to lure the kid inside. Have a seat. Let me talk to you. I decided it was time to pick a kid and go for it. I needed a confession, not an answer. And I was still hungry. Why'd you bite your classmate, Rachel? (sighs) Mr. Sanderkin, what are you doing? Hey, she was here when I walked in. You should have never walked out. When did you walk out? I didn't. I don't understand. Or did she? Regardless, Rachel was the one bitten. That's a fact. Why in the world would you question her? Hey, hey. I'll decide on the facts around here. How about you let me continue my investigation, and I'll let you continue grading papers at your desk or whatever it is that you do around here. I gave her one of those stop-talking looks, but I wasn't sure she got the message. Apparently she did. Gold star for her. Tell me, Rachel, why did you bite your classmate? What would cause you to commit such a heinous crime? I was bitten! There's the mark right here! I didn't do it! You've been biting kids, and I want you to admit it right now! I want the truth! I can handle it. Can you handle holding that lie in your itty-bitty heart? I, 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 I did it! I did the bite! <laughs> would you look at that? What? That can't be true! You? But how? Ma'am, ma'am, please, let me handle this. I'm a professional. All right, kid, it's okay. You tell me what happened. Well, I, I didn't mean to. I, 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 <laughs> I see you're crying. Finish that story, and you can get yourself a wet nap. Well, I, I bit Samantha during recess. I, I didn't mean to, not, not really. And, <laughs> Mutual self-assured destruction. I like this Samantha kid. Added bonus, she's not a squealer. And why did you bite poor, sweet Samantha? Because she always takes the good basketball during recess. And I told her today, I said, no, don't do it. But she never listens. She tried to take it anyway, and I wanted to let go. So I bit her. Did I mention these chairs are tiny? Like Brian Cranston's part in Godzilla. Well, Miss Landon, I think you have your culprits. This concludes the terms of my service. I'll show myself out and collect a check on my way. Yeah, I picked a kid and went with it. I picked the one that was bitten. I mean, why not, right? Sometimes it pays off. And when you're Abe Zanarkin, it always pays off. Now where are those dinosaur nuggets? This has been another thrilling adventure in the Abe Zanarkin saga. Tune in next time. Hey, Miss Landon. Get out of my dreams into my 65 Mustang convertible. It's yellow. You like yellow, right? That was our first radio drama performance. Top five Ethan Hawke movies. You're looking them up, aren't you? Uh-huh. Cheater. <laughs> well, uh, for one, I'm not as versed in Ethan Hawke movies as you. Is anyone as averse in Ethan Hawke movies as I am? No. We shouldn't be able to look them up. Hence why I called you a cheater when you were looking him up. So, all right, I, I won't look it up. Top five Ethan Hawke movies. Go. Before Sunrise. Before Sunset. Predestination. Training Day. I'm going to throw Waking Life. He's only in there for one scene, but I'm going to throw it in there. I can't remember any other Ethan Hawke movies. Boyhood. Good pick. Training Day, definitely. Gattaca. Oh, I know it sounds strange. God, man, I want Gattaca is not one. one of my favorite movies. I thought it was groundbreaking for its time. And it's, it's not still, one of your favorite movies? It's not one of my favorite movies of all time. So actually, I think we did pretty good on Ethan Hawke movies. We because really did. 
Thanks for listening to Fridays on the Fly. I'm Eric. And I'm Ward. You can find us on iTunes, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, SoundCloud, and probably other sites. Just go to those sites, search for Fridays on the Fly. You'll see a picture of us. That's it. I think you know how Google works. And if you don't, just search for Fridays on the Fly and we'll show you how. Thank you for listening. 